Just kidding. Hey guys, Martin here again, and I'm back with another video. Now, if you watched my previous video, you probably realized that I forgot to edit out the end part. I had a bit of a mind blank, and I was left staring into space. I hope that doesn't happen to me today, and if it does, I'll be sure to edit it out this time. Now, I hope you enjoyed the last video, and today's video is on a slightly different topic. It's on carbohydrate metabolism, okay, and there's going to be a few parts to this series, so this is part one, and I am going to keep this very simple because I know this topic can be very complicated, and personal trainers out there don't need to know the semantics of carbohydrate metabolism, they just need to know the basics, okay, so this video is aimed towards personal trainers and even just gen pop people who want to know more about the topic, okay? So I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible and I'm going to give you guys time in between each video to digest the information and do your own research, okay? So that is why I'm not making one big video uh, on this topic. Now to start off, we're going to talk about the structure of a carbohydrate molecule. Now a carbohydrate is in its simplest form a glucose molecule which is made up of six carbon molecules, okay, so it's a six carbon chain as shown here. Now, binded to the carbon chain, we also have oxygen and hydrogen molecules, okay, so we've got oxygens and hydrogen. So, for today, I have referred to oxygen as just O and hydrogen as just H, okay. Now, if you've ever read a textbook or a research paper or something like that, you may have seen that carbohydrate is referred to as CHO, and this is why it is referred to as CHO, because in its simplest form and in a biochemical uh, sense, carbohydrate is six carbon structure along with oxygen and hydrogen molecules, and all together we've got CHO, okay, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygens. So per gram of carbohydrate we consume, we get four calories worth of energy from each gram, okay? Now, it doesn't matter what type of carbohydrate you consume, whether it's whole grain, whether it's high GI, low GI, whether it's a complex carb, you know, white bread, brown bread, whatever it might be, each gram of carbohydrate is going to contain four calories worth of energy. Now, we know that total daily calorie intake is the most important thing when it comes to body composition. So if you have body composition goals, then you shouldn't be worrying too much about the type of carbohydrates you are consuming, but you should be worrying more about your total carbohydrate intake and above that, your total calorie intake for the day. Now, in saying this, not all carbs are physiologically equal. Complex carbs with a high fiber content are going to minimize surges in blood glucose, okay, because they have a slower digestion uh, rate. Whereas a high GI carb is going to cause a spike, a surge in blood glucose because of its rapid digestive properties. Now, as I said before, both of these carbohydrates are going to yield four calories worth of energy. So if your goal, if you have body composition goals, then you shouldn't be worrying too much about which one you are consuming. Okay, sugar in moderation is totally fine, even though it uh, comes with a, a surge in blood glucose. The only problem that sugar comes with is its high concentration and high palatability, making it very easy to overconsume, leading to a overconsumption in calories, and that is what can cause weight gain. But it doesn't come directly from the sugar. Okay, as I said, sugar in moderation is totally fine as long as you're accounting for your total daily calories. So when we consume carbohydrates, they get converted to glucose within our blood and we see an increase in blood glucose or blood sugar levels. Now, high blood glucose levels are not desirable for our body, so it finds a way to dispose of the glucose, and it does this through the hormone insulin, okay? So if you're not quite familiar with insulin, insulin is an anabolic hormone, okay? Or, or a storage home hormone. So it pulls nutrients in and stores them. Now, its main target is glucose, and today we are focusing on glucose, but insulin can also store fatty acids, and it can also store amino acids within skeletal muscle. Another anabolic property of insulin is its suppression effect on muscle protein breakdown. So it doesn't really have any effect on our protein 
synthetic rate per se, but it does uh, blunt muscle protein breakdown, which is desirable if you have uh, hypertrophy goals. Now, the way insulin disposes of the glucose within our bloodstream is through the activation of GLUT4. Okay, we see GLUT4 here sitting within the cell. GLUT4 is a transporter protein which transports glucose around the body, okay? And it sits in the cytoplasm of the cell. So here we see the classic cell that you may have seen in a textbook before or in science class back in high school. Okay, so we've got the cell, the cytoplasm, which is just the inner part of the cell. We also have the nucleus, which is the control center of the cell. And what I've drawn here, uh, those, those red lines there, are insulin receptors, which sit on the, the plasma membrane of the cell, waiting for insulin to bind to. So as blood glucose rises, insulin gets released from the beta cells within our pancreas. Okay, so our pancreas is essentially what secretes insulin upon a spike in blood glucose and the insulin binds to its receptor on either a muscle cell or a liver cell. It can also happen on an adipocyte, so a fat cell, but for today we're just going to focus on muscle cells and liver cells, okay? So we get insulin being released and binding to its receptor. Now, upon this uh, binding of insulin to its receptor, we see the activation of GLUT4, okay? And we call this GLUT4 translocation. So GLUT4 actually changes its location. Now, it moves from the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane, okay? So it sits on the cell wall. And this is very important because without this occurring, we can't actually get glucose through the plasma membrane and into the cell. So GLUT4 is essentially a channel uh, or acts as a channel for glucose to enter the cell. Okay, so it moves from the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane. Okay, and as I said, it acts as a channel or a window for glucose to enter through the cell. We see glucose entering the cell. through that channel, okay, and being converted into glycogen within the muscle cell or the liver cell through the process of glycogenesis. Now, glycogen is just a larger chain of glucose molecules, so hundreds to thousands of uh, carbon molecules binded together within, within the chain. And as I said, the process is called glycogenesis, which is uh, catalyzed by the enzyme glycogen synthase, and this process does need ATP. ATP is the energy currency of the cells within our body and pretty much every biological process that occurs within our body uh, relies on ATP for energy. Now the intramuscular glycogen that gets converted uh, from glucose is a major source of fuel during exercise and in the context of resistance training intramuscular glycogen allows for ATP production to fuel the uh, contractile elements of our muscles during contraction along with phosphocreatine. So as I said, GLUT4 translocation is the only way we can get glucose from the bloodstream into the cell. And for people with insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes, this mechanism can be disrupted due to the fact that their insulin receptors may be deficient, meaning they aren't as sensitive to insulin and this can disrupt the GLUT4 translocation. Now, this is why it is increasingly important for this population, so people with insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, to exercise because exercise activates GLUT4 translocation independent of insulin and it does this through a contraction mediated pathway. So, the contraction of our muscles can activate GLUT4 and this is due to the calcium release that we uh, achieve when we contract our muscles. So if you're not familiar with muscle contraction, as we contract our muscles, we get the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is, just, is a little um, barn, you could say, within our muscles that holds calcium and releases it upon contraction. The calcium activates 
the cross bridging cycle because it actually allows the myosin to attach to the actin head and pull on it, um, causing contraction to occur. And calcium release also triggers the translocation of GLUT4 from the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane, allowing glucose to enter the cell. Now, as I said, glucose can be converted to glycogen through the process of glycogenesis, and glycogen can also be trans, uh, transformed back into glucose through glycogenolysis. Now, this generally occurs when liver glycogen gets converted back into glucose for an extra muscular glucose supply, and this is usually the case in activities that have high demand for glucose, so aerobic activities like long distance runs, um, we do see liver glycogen being converted back into blood glucose to power uh, the contractile elements of our muscles. Now, the last conversion I wanted to talk about um, for today is the conversion of non-carbohydrate substrates into glucose. And this process is called gluconeogenesis. Now, this particularly occurs with amino acids um, that become deaminated, so they lose their nitrogen component, which is a very important component of the amino acid. Urea gets formed and leaves the body through urine, and we are left with, you could say, a carbon skeleton of the amino acid, and this gets used to go through gluconeogenesis um, and be converted into glucose. Now, this process generally occurs in a nutrient-deprived state when carbohydrate entering the body is rare, so you know, in a calorie deficit or an aggressive calorie deficit, we do see gluconeogenesis occur to allow for that glucose supply. Now another substrate that can be used through gluconeogenesis is the glycerol backbone of a fatty acid. So if you're not familiar with the fatty acid structure, we have a glycerol backbone made of three carbons and attached to that backbone, we have uh, three fatty acids. Now, when those fatty acids get deattached um, to go through beta oxidation and to be oxidized, we are left with a glycerol backbone, which can also go through gluconeogenesis and get converted into glucose for energy. So those are the three main conversions that we see carbohydrate go through. So we have glycogenesis, which is glucose being converted to glycogen, glycogenolysis, which is glycogen being converted back into glucose, and we also have gluconeogenesis, which is non-carbohydrate substrates being converted into glucose. So this is all for today's um, part of carbohydrate metabolism. In the next part, I will be talking more about how carbohydrates and glucose get oxidized within the body to produce ATP. I do urge you guys to do some more research on the concepts covered today if you want to know more, and I'll see you guys soon.